Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, ladies and gentlemen, Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Uh, really enjoyed that Christmas episode. I hope everybody had a tremendous uh, Christmas, yep. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, uh, Kwanzaa. I've always wanted to be part of a Kwanzaa celebration. So let's put it out there for next year. Foley wants in on the Kwanzaa celebration. And now we're on to New Year's Eve, which I believe we're debuting uh, the 30th. That's right. So this is uh, New Year's Eve's Eve. Uh, Did we miss Festivus for the rest of us? Because we've got to get that going (laughs) next year. (laughs) I'm still trying to find the uh, Ben and Jerry's Festivus flavor, which was outstanding. But I haven't seen it in years. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen you're it Mick years. Foley. We ought to work on that. Can we? Can I think we? we could figure that out. Or maybe someone can make me some handmade Festivus. Okay. Okay. Let's let's work on that. And in the meantime, we're going to talk about one of the more interesting topics in the history of wrestling, and by all accounts, a tremendous person, the artist formerly known as China, the eighth wonder of the world. Of course, the real life Joni Lauer. Uh, this is going to be a fun show, is it not? think but he, so. it's a, it, it's likely to get take us places well she made such a fun and and i mean she she left an important mark in wrestling she did and i don't think she gets celebrated or acknowledged enough and i want to do that today let's do it and uh, we all know how the story ends and of course that's sad but man let's talk about the good times let's as do much it as we can i had a lot of them with joni too um she trains at Killer Kowalski School in 95. She works a handful of indie shows as Joni Lee in the New England area. And then somehow, someway, she meets Hunter and Sean after a show in 1996, which, of course, eventually leads to her joining the company. And somewhere along the way, she and Hunter uh, become a romantic item. Did you get a chance to meet China before her debut, or do you meet her once she's a part of the crew? Yeah, I did not meet her before her debut. I met her an hour or two afterwards. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I thought one of the things really interesting on um, the Joni documentary that Vice did. Yes. Uh, was they showed Joni as Joni Lee. And she was pretty good at her promos. Yeah. For someone who was that new to the business, she really had a command and a style. And so we knew her as the, you know, like the silent uh, but deadly uh, weapon. But man, she she could talk for someone at that stage of her career. We didn't get to really see that Joni, you know, uh, that direction her career was going. Of course, the, she becomes a huge star almost right. overnight. Now, this was the one, I think in the past, I thought that I had missed a pay-per-view or that I wasn't on a pay-per-view, and I've referred to driving with my family from the Atlanta area where we live to Chattanooga, and I sat in the stands and was there for her debut, but that was actually February 97, which makes sense. But I just, I wasn't in the mix for that month. Um, Most WWE fans did not know what I looked like underneath the mask, unless they were Cactus Jack fans, which I would say maybe 20% of WWE fans were. There was a crossover, but it wasn't huge. Right. Not until I I, uh, came out as Dude Love did most WWE fans even know what I looked like. So therefore, I was able to put all my hair up under a hat, put the brim down, sit in the friends and family section, and watch the events unfold. There was a great, I think, five-way, was it, with Brett? And it was a four-way. It was, four it way. was a In Your House Final Four, Chattanooga, Brett, Tennessee. Steve, Vader. And Undertaker. Undertaker. Yeah. Uh, and so we had a chance to see um, this incredible specimen just shaking Terry Runnels like a rag doll. Yes. And uh, almost at, from the position on the other side of the guardrails, like a crazed fan, like a crazed fan, this Amazon slinging yeah. this. Yeah, and it, and it had a sense of legitimacy to yes. it. Yes, um, and it was uh, it was Hunter against uh, Goldust, right? Yeah. So the 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 program that we're working at the time is uh, Rocky Maivia versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Okay. Um, but Goldust has certainly been in a feud with Hunter Hearst Helmsley, and they're actually gonna. You know, be fresh off of uh, a Royal Rumble match, and uh, and and just keep this thing going for a bit. But when we actually see the attack, it's a part of a six-man tag. Okay, it's the okay. Nation of Domination, 
uh, which at the time is Crush, Farouk, and Savio Vega. And they're going to take on Bart Gunn, Flash Funk, and Goldust, who, of course, has Marlena with him. Uh, w- w- with, uh, him. And, yeah, there we go, this brutal attack from someone that we might not have so we did. We did not see China at that pay per view in February. No, we did because she's on the other side of the guardrail, grabs Marlena and okay. ragdolls her. And you even made it a point, I think, before to say that Colette went out of her way to tell China what yeah. a great job she did. She did. We see her backstage, and there's this uh, man. It was like a paradox because this incredibly strong woman was so gentle backstage so soft-spoken that my wife was the first person who went up to her and said, oh, you were amazing tonight. She said, you think so? so? You know, she was she was looking for some of that yes. positive reinforcement. Uh, and I, it just struck me as to just how different those two sides of her were. The, the strength and uh, the vulnerability. Yes, well said. The next night on Raw, China's back. This time she's going to bear hug Marlena, shake her like a rag doll. It's a gigantic statement. It stands the test of time. You got China's huge muscular arms, Terry's little body. Mm-hmm. It's quite the sight. And, and this is almost kind of an accident. Just to remind everybody, Hunter had been using Mr. Hughes or Curtis Hughes as his bodyguard. And, of course, Mr. Hughes was normally the strong, silent type. He just essentially stood behind whoever the the act was. He was the the heavy or the second. Mm-hmm. But the, saw, the silent assassin, like you might see in like a James Bond-type movie, she's going to assume that role. And I think on the surface, a lot of people would see, that won't work. But, man, Hunter and Sean, they really believed in it. They did. So they met her after a show. It's uh, before, obviously before... They debut, talked right. to her, pitched Vince on the idea uh, that this was something that could really help Hunter. And the word is he was hesitant. The maybe, Hunter was hesitant. I thought that maybe Vince was, uh, and eventually Sean maybe pushed it and they acquiesced. Either way, China had some folks go to bat for her, and she gets the opportunity, and it becomes the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, Think about how many characters debut in such a fashion as a a crazed fan and then become a bodyguard and then become a phenom. I mean, you talk about humble beginnings. That almost feels like kind of a throwaway part that really becomes a big part of the promotion. Yeah, she took off like a rocket. Um, You know, we know that you're going to be involved in in the whole Hunter feud, and you guys are really going to take off in 1997 Mm -hmm. together. I often think about how different that could have looked if she's not involved and it's Mr. Hughes. That would have been a totally different dynamic for you guys. Totally different not. and not as good. And I'm not knocking Hughes because uh, a few weeks ago I saw some footage of Hughes in WCW. And brother, he could go. He could move and he could bump. Uh, but it would not have been the same chemistry. And I, I love the chemistry. I love what China brought to the dance. Uh, loved working with her. I uh, loved working with Triple H. So uh, this is my baby face. Uh, first time we've seen Mankind as a baby face. And I've talked before about uh, Triple H as a ring general. Yes. Definitely a great guy to be in there with. So it's not just a bunch of spots. It's things that make sense. I remember Hunter telling me he thought that this Mankind character should have one strong comeback instead of, you know, uh, hope spots. Um and we worked each night. I thought we had good matches each night. You know, I took issue, you know, months ago on the show with only getting the two and a half stars at the cage match. I thought that was a, a good match, and it stands the test of time with a great final moment. Yes. Um, but by and large, every night we went in that ring, we were having, I thought, very good matches. No doubt. And, and that cage match in particular has a very memorable spot, which we've talked about in the archives where she slams your head Whew. with that cage, and uh, you were seeing stars hurting for certain. I bring this up again because this is happening at a time where on the other channel, we'll call it the fall of 97, Disco Inferno is going to flat refuse to put over Miss Jackie, Miss Texas, Jacqueline Moore, who is a, a bodybuilder in her own right. Yeah. And as a result, he gets his walking papers. Eventually, cooler heads prevail. He comes back. They get the match, but... Clearly, it's a different time, a different era. Uh, I'm not here to necessarily debate, you know, uh, intergender matches, but there was a stigma of I can't sell for a woman. Yeah. That 
was not an issue for you with China. No. Yeah. And I was the first one. And I don't want to denigrate someone, you know, who's not on the uh, crew uh, who made a couple of bad decisions. Ultimately, he left because he wouldn't put over Kurgan. Uh, talk about Ahmed Johnson, but Ahmed wasn't going to sell for her. And I don't think it was a case where I walked in and said, I will. I think it was, I bided my time. And when the situation arose, I was like, how about we do a spot? And so I think the uh, reversal into the stairs where China power slammed me onto the stairs to where the lower half of my body, the lower quarter, you know, below the knees, whiplashed onto the uh, onto the uh, steps was a really good way, not only a good spot, but long after the pop subsided, I think there was a feeling in the dressing room that if he can do it, yes. come to me, then I guess I can too. So I felt like that opened up the door. Was uh, that a conscious effort of yours? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Going back to one of the things you said you wanted to be remembered for, you wanted to treat people maybe a little nicer than you were treated. Yeah. Prime example here. No? Right. So, yeah. And I did have people who went out of their way to help me. Yes. Had other people went out of their way to make life a little more difficult than it needed to be. And I knew how I felt in both situations. And I wanted to be the person that offered those opportunities. And so instead of it just being taking a, a punch or a forearm, like, no, we're going to do a spot. And it's going to be impressive. And at that time, I was probably about 280. She's going to power slam a 280-pound man onto the ring steps, and it's going to be impressive. Is there a lesson to be learned about you being willing to, to try things? I mean, you've really you've tried some pretty crazy stuff, whether it was you know, the Mankind character, some of the crazy stuff you did in Japan with Cactus Shack, but Dude Love, Mr. Sako, uh, <laughs> working with China, letting her you know, do power moves on you. Like, it, it almost feels as if, you know, in your ability to sort of paint outside the lines and color outside the lines. You've been as fearless as Cactus Jack was in a death match. <laughs> because a guy like Ahmed Johnson saw himself as, no, this is my character. But you're willing to have jokes and be vulnerable. And I, I, I think there's probably a lesson in there. I'm just maybe not articulating it as well as I could. Uh, yeah, I, I think there is a lesson. Like, uh, first of all, you don't want to be, to me, the two dirtiest words in this language are what if. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be the guy on the couch going, what if, what if. I mean, I imagine uh, Ahmed Johnson has thought, what if I had put Kurgan over in Houston? Like, I might have been with that company for another four years. Yeah. You know, maybe my name would be up there with uh, the elite people when they're talked about. And in this case, I, I didn't want to be the guy, like, I'm going to let that opportunity slip. Like, I, I knew, first of all, it was going to add to the match. I know she can do it safely because I've seen her in the gym. I did just go to the gym. And uh, I talk her through it, and I feel like she can do it, and it's going to be impressive. And like I said, it's going to, it's, there's, it's going to be a signal to the rest of the dressing room that it's okay to sell for this woman. The nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. You know the deal. Folius Pod is brought to you by Blue Chew. Guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom, you know, when it's time to uh, step up to the plate. And that's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take these dudes anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Mick and I like to think of it as a hot tag for your wiener. Now the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it, y'all. Have some better sex, shall we? And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your very first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring Foley's Pod. 
Sincerely, Blue Chew's been with us from day one. They're going to be with you for a long, long time, too. You just got to try it. You can't beat free, y'all. Go check it out right now. BlueChew.com, promo code Foley. Let's talk about how her confidence has to be tested here. I mean, this is, uh, as you said, maybe a shy, vulnerable, you know, she's trying to find her way very much in a man's world, Mm -hmm. but she's also uh, someone who is, uh, well, she's different. Mm -hmm. She looks different than this is very much the era where we've got the Sables and the Sunnies and the Marlenas. She has a totally different presentation. I can't even imagine what the pressure of being a woman in that industry or any industry in the public world would have been under in that era. But now she's really going to be asked to test her metal against the guys, knowing there's going to be folks who don't like that idea and don't want to work with her, but she's got to make it work on the road, living out of a suitcase, which in and of itself is a challenge. Yeah. Uh, could you see through 1997 or with her starting in February that she started to get more comfortable? Oh, sure. Now, first of all, she and Hunter became uh, an item in pretty quick order and she had a support system. I can't tell you about the women because I wasn't there. I can right. tell you among the guys, we did look out for her. We thought the world of her and we probably failed her when she left by not continuing to be that support system that we had, but I would go out on a limb and say she never felt more at home than she did on a bus, in a rental car, backstage, in the ring. Like she, all these places were safe places for her. And I think it was only when she went into the outside world without that support system that the vulnerability that made her so special was, her downfall. Her downfall. 1997. You know, we're not stepping, we're not out of bounds or speaking out of turn to say that Shawn Michaels was difficult, <laughs> and he had developed a reputation amongst <laughs> the boys, and because his traveling companion a lot of times and his tag team partner, so to speak, in life was Hunter. I wonder, is there any concern that maybe she's, you know, hitching? her wagon to the wrong horse? Like, is there any residual heat that I don't like Sean, so therefore I don't like her? Or is everybody able to sort of separate? <laughs> My feeling, looking back after like all these years, is there was no residual heat yeah. on China, that uh, Hunter had already served his time Yes. <laughs> in, in WWE purgatory after the curtain call. You got to love that. Okay, here's five guys, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to punish, punish one, one guy. Yes. <laughs> but he, uh, we all, well, oh, man, poor Hunter. He's taking it like a man, though. You know, he did. And he went yeah. out there. He had good matches every night. I was on those cards with him. You know, he, he wrestled Mark Merrow a lot, had really good matches with Mark. And, uh, and then he used it as a motivating force. Uh, so I don't remember any of whatever he... Sean had, I think we all realized she didn't deserve any of it. So she becomes one of the boys, for yeah. lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, there, It's a different time, and, and boy, there was a different language that was used back then, and maybe we weren't as nice and accepting of folks' differences. Do you remember whether it's fans or, or other folks in the company, her having particular challenges with just... Well, the fans could be really mean. The fans could be really mean. And I think that as mean as they were in person, uh, the cruelty online, uh, especially as her life began to unravel, could not have helped. You know, I can't prove it hurt, but nobody likes to see that stuff. And uh, it just, it was one thing, you're a heel and people are yelling at you that you're a man. I remember her coming back, you know, Shawn Michaels, on, I think on three successive nights, uh, we didn't have a main event because Shawn walked out because yes. he's, in, he's always inciting the reaction and then walking out because of the reaction he incited. Yes. Uh, Through Arkansas and uh, Memphis. Yeah, and yeah, that. I was there those nights. And uh, I remember Joni come back had like four or five loogies on her. Oh. And uh, Joni, Joni got loogies all over. Oh, oh. It, she just, uh, like, oh, okay, this is just an occupational hazard. 
so I wasn't there, you know, I, I don't know about the, the man stuff, you know, that would be the big thing, you know, man, she's got, you know, male genitalia. I, I just, it's weird to me to, to think about the pressure that you must be on. I mean, I know that sometimes people who watch from afar just assume, well, this is a celebrity and they're a millionaire and blah, blah. well, that may not always be the case. It right. might be eventually, but you talked about a few weeks ago sort of the uh, living that rock star life where there's a ton of attention on you. And she went from being, for lack of a better word, a civilian mm -hmm. to now she's thrust into the limelight. And so maybe there was a whisper at a gym here or there, but now it's almost encouraged since she's a, she's a quote unquote bad guy character. Well, I'm, so, I'm allowed and encouraged to say awful things. And I can only imagine how that is to go from a normal person, so to speak, to now you got to deal with all that. Right. And as a lady, man, that's just, that's tough. And things got so much worse, I would say. Can't prove it. But with the uh, dawn of the popularity of the internet, mm -hmm. social media, now you go from someone who accepts that. This is part of my job. We get in the car and whew, we're off to the next town. But now you have to live it. And if you, you're encouraged, WWE encourages you know, we all encourage, not, not just WWE, across the board. If you want to be somebody, you have to be on social media. Yes. That's almost how you prove you're over, by yes. the number of people you have. To be good at it and to get those numbers, no matter how much they push you, you have to interact with people. Yes. And so you spend time on there. Now, I'm somebody who bailed out a couple months ago on Twitter, and I feel so much better. Uh, I saw that Trent Reznor had bailed out, and he said, you know, even more so than the uh, the problems with the new ownership, for my own mental health, I have to get off of here. Nobody should be subject. That shouldn't be part of your daily life. Yes. Is that you're at home with your children, and it always felt to me like someone was reaching out with a reed and just whacking you on the, on the shin. It's not going to cripple you, but it's an unnecessary... Inconvenience. The inconvenience and a pain and a heaviness that lays over you. And uh, we had just dabbled just a tiny bit in a previous episode comparing uh, WWE superstars. A, now is not the time to make an Al Snow joke, even though I was thinking about it. Sure. But uh, what we do in wrestling versus our friends in the adult arts. And I said, well, they go through what we do times 100. Mm. The stigma is 100 times worse, but no doubt there's still a stigma with what we do. And I think people feel like it's like they're not, we can say whatever we want. Yes. We, they kind of know that we have to be on there. If you're, not, if you're not reading your comments, you're not being as good as you can be, there's such an impetus on the performers to be engaged, mm -hmm. to get their stuff out there, to get the likes, to get the uh, the shares. Um, and you take a lot on the chin. I, John Cena, he learned to laugh it off. You know, and he says he does, he would tell me he does go through there just to see what's out there, just so he knows what he's dealing with. But man, it's it's not an it's not a license to be cruel. But no. for a lot of people, it is, and I think in the current environment, especially on that platform, more so than ever. But um, I'm fast forwarding a little bit in this episode to where Joni was at my house, and I took a photo, and it was like, yeah, nine out of ten are really nice, a few are a little unpleasant, and then every once in a while, someone's just going out of their way to hurt her feelings. And I'm finding myself deleting these messages just because I don't want her visit at the Foley house to be a painful one because of some inconsiderate prick. Yes. Turds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, her role in DX, I don't think, can be overstated. No. I mean, I know that um, there's been a lot of debate uh, about, you know, whether she should have been included or whether she should have went into the Hall of Fame by herself or what have you. But man, her contributions were immeasurable to that group. I don't mm -hmm. think it's the same group without her. It's not the same group. And I, I think even acknowledging Shawn Michaels as the best wrestler of his generation, um, I think I'm one of the uh, many uh, majority who feel like the best DX lineup 
was without Sean. Was, was, out, was without Sean. Yeah. Hunter was able to spread his wings and fly. We introduced uh, the New Age Outlaws who had gotten red hot on their own in, a, in short order. X-Pac comes in. He's right at home there. But without Joni... She kind of pulls it all together. Yeah, it just uh, wow, wow. It was a, it was a really uh, you know, 1927 Yankees were known as Murderers Row. They were a Murderers Row of WWE superstars. When you first start working with her in '97, and, and you're one of the first guys to say, "Okay, let's do a spot," would, did you ever imagine she would wind up wrestling guys? <laughs> no, no. I just thought. That was going to be her role, that she would interfere. A manager and, character. Yeah, manager character would get get the better of guys. Uh, at that time, you know, we there was no, no not even a thought of a guy firing back on her. So that even when <coughs> Triple H and I had our match at Madison Square Garden in September 1997, the only way we had physicality is that uh, Joni was... Uh, into the stairs, a reversal, and it was Hunter who accidentally ran into Joni, sandwiched her into the stairs, and that's why she wasn't there until like a split second after the finish. So you had to be really careful about how you did it. There was no stunners on women, you know. There, were, we would go a little overboard, I think, and uh, we were doing things that ECW had done a few years earlier, and their crowd was was cool with that and uh, you know and I even partook a little bit in that and I regret that um, you do I do yeah I do even though it played into the storyline at the time uh, but there were other guys who really feasted on it you know um, and I don't think people I think people uh, it's tricky to say you hope people can separate um, uh, a fantasy from fiction fiction from reality yes and you hope they realize that when tommy dreamer goes home he's not pile, pile driving, driving ladies <laughs> yeah. no i don't imagine he is <laughs> so it was uh at the time yeah i thought it was just opening the door for Joni to get ever more involved in the matches but i did not think she'd be actually uh uh taking on the men Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the way China is going to evolve as a part of DX. Before she gets into wrestling, we see, you know, the the silent, strong, muscular version of China, um, but she's nonverbal and serious and a heel. And then fast forward, DX becomes a babyface group, and yeah. they're fun, and she's goofing around. Did you have a preference? I thought she did both well. Yeah. I love seeing that other side of her. Yes. I remember uh, Noel was taken aback uh, when the guys were doing a lot of stuff, mooning, pulling their pants down. And then she ended up pulling down the uh, trunks and showing off There's, <laughs> the glutes. Like, yes. Oh, my goodness. you know. And, and then uh, Noel says, why China show her peaches? Oh, wow. Her peaches, because she was so close with China to a point where she thought of Joni as her best friend. Wow, that's awesome. Isn't that cute? And that's so, fantastic. Now, this is something I can't cannot supply for our podcast, because our friends at A&E are really super enthusiastic about the China documentary they've put together. They feel like they tell a great story. <clears throat> and they were, I've mentioned my daughter, and they're asking about this relationship with my daughter, friendship. And I said, you know, would you like to ask her? I said, she's visiting. She's in town. So <laughs> I can make a quick call. 20, 30 minutes later, Colette and Noelle are there, and Noelle will be part of the uh, documentary with a really sweet photo. I mean, Joni was just so gentle with her. It was just, uh, I can't find the photo taken from behind of her holding uh, Noelle's hand. But uh, there were uh, several photos of them together. She would lead her off to the makeup area, and Noelle would come back, and she'd have a little bit of makeup on, a little eyeshadow, or nails would be done. And she just loved this. She just loved her, you know? This was a great role model. And she, um, <clears throat> she would always compare everything strength-wise to China. You know, she would see dolphins. Uh, are dolphins strong? Oh, yeah. Stronger than China. Oh, that's great. And so China was the parameter upon which all other strengths were 
measured. Hey guys, I'm pumped to brag about a brand new sponsor here on the program and is a personal friend of mine for many, many years. I'm talking to you about Camper Max, specializing in max discounted pricing on travel trailers and fifth wheel RVs that can be delivered anywhere in the lower 48. That's right, from your office, your cell phone, or your couch. Click or call and find out how easy it is to start enjoying that RVing lifestyle. Now, how easy is it? Well, the Camper Max discount will fit any budget offering easy financing with extended terms. It's just too easy. Thanks to my pal, Rod Wagner. I've been personal friends with Rod for a long, long time, and he is now opening up to the entire lower 48. So if you're here in the United States and you're thinking about buying a travel trailer, you're thinking about buying a fifth wheel RV, or maybe you're thinking of selling yours, visit my buddy Rod at campermax.com. That's C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com campermax.com that's max with two x's or give him a call 256-320-7033 either way let the folks at camper max know that conrad sent you and they're going to give you that friend of a friend hookup that i've enjoyed for oh so many years camper max is the home of the max discount that's campermax.com camper m-a-x-x.com by the way if you're looking to purchase a motorhome hang in there my buddy rod is working on that now it's all going down at campermax.com let's get out there let's enjoy 2023 this could be one heck of a new year thanks to campermax.com or 256-320-7033 and let them know that conrad sent you yeah let's talk about um not just the pairing with Hunter that's on screen for 18 months. We can't really talk about her story and not talk about Mark Henry. Her first official match is her and uh, X-Pac teaming up and losing a handicap match to Mark Henry on Raw. Um, I like that pairing. Me too. And I'll tell you where uh, the potential was lost. Um, when This is when... Mark, China had to go out on a date mm-hmm. with Mark, right? Mm-hmm. As a punishment. Mark has written some poetry, uh, but she's not buying it until they're at a local watering hole in the uh, Baltimore area. I remember because I was in Baltimore. We were there at the, now it's the Mariner Center, but it was the Baltimore Arena. And we don't know what's going to transpire on the video, but all of a sudden these people are mocking Mark, and she stands up and says, Stay away from my man. And you know it works because all the boys, collectively men and women, the boys, are watching the monitor and we pop big time as they clean house, right? This is like something out of a movie. Yes. It's like something out of a movie. And I love Mark. But Mark makes the decision to have knee surgery that seems like it's optional. It's got to be addressed. There's a time and a place, and it was like, not now, not now. Get that meniscus fixed, wrap that son of a gun up, and wait two months until this has had a chance to get some legs. And it didn't have a chance to get legs. Yeah. And so it was almost a one-off. If there was a follow-up, it was it was brief. Mark went on to do great things, yes. and he's a very, uh, you know, a very deserving Hall of Fame member. But he was fairly young in the business at that time, and I wish that someone had talked to him. Like, if I had known and said, don't do it now, don't do it now, do what I, well, I don't know if I had done it then, but I had the knee surgery, you know, when my storyline was over. And Hunter took me out with a sledgehammer. And now I have a chance to enjoy some time with my kids. But don't do it now. Right. And so that went from something that could have been very big into something that was just, uh a bright moment, of, you know, a shooting star, if you will. But it could have been really big. And it gave you an indication as to what type of attention China was capable of commanding. Let's talk about uh, something that you touched on a few weeks ago. You mentioned when you were leaving one day as a commissioner, you, you run into Stacey Keebler. Yeah. And you wanted to give her some advice, and she cut you off. She knew what you were going to talk about. She yeah. wasn't going to do plastic surgery stuff. Uh, China opted to participate mm-hmm. in plastic surgery stuff. And I'm wondering in hindsight, I don't know if you ever talked to her about it. Do you think that was her call or was that a company request? Because you sort of insinuated that 
maybe ladies in the WWE would feel pressure to do this or that. They or might feel like they, ah, they, I think they f might feel like they look at who's getting pushed and what they have and what the uh, what those people getting pushed have as opposed to what they the uh, other person does not have. They might make that call themselves. Right. I don't think an edict ever went down saying you have to do this. Um, with Joni, from reading her book, it certainly seemed like it was something she wanted to do. Yes. Uh, look, it's impo It's almost impossible to have any sense of voluptuousness when you have a really low body fat percentage. I think that's a fact. I don't think I'm speaking out of order, although I'm not a scientist. Um, and the implants give women who are very lean a chance to have uh, breasts. And and what I love about today's, the, the women in today's wrestling, some some choose to do it and yes. others don't. They're not penalized. No. They're not penalized. And we've the gotten better in that We've regard. gotten a lot better and we've realized, now when I say we, I'm primarily talking about a few distinct people, realize it's not a one size fits all. Right. One, you know, and then you'll see someone who will get it, and after you know they've already been big stars. Like if that makes them happy, then they sh people should do what makes them happy. But they should do their research, and they should understand now that it's not a prerequisite. It's a decision they can make for themselves. Decision they make for yeah. themselves. But my feeling was, uh, no, this is just from reading jo Joni's book because that's not something I would have talked to her about. I, right. I don't know why I felt compelled to. I just thought Stacy Keebler might be making a big mistake, but Joni had it. Seemed like she was proud of them, you know, enjoyed it, enjoyed the femininity, and uh, and I thought she really, man, she. Where how what can I say? I thought they worked for her, you know, they worked for her. But primarily, the thing is, I think that she and she liked it, and that's what's important. That's very important. Her biggest moment so far is when she eliminates uh, Mr. McMahon to win the corporate Royal Rumble on Raw to earn the right to be number 30 in the 1999 Royal Rumble match. She is the first woman to ever be in the Royal Rumble. And the pop when she came out to the ring that night is unbelievable, man. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It tells you that they've got something here. Mm -hmm. And maybe where folks were cautious or hesitant two years prior we can cast that aside right. in, in less than two years now. Think about that. Debuting in February of 97, now getting a huge pop at the Rumble in 99. She's covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, she enters the Rumble and eliminates Mark Henry before Stone Cold eliminates her. Uh, the next night, she's going to turn heel and join the corporation. And um, she's, she's red hot as a baby face before she does this. This feels like a missed opportunity to me to... And I understand in this era, we're very much in the, the Russo era, not picking on Vince, but I know he was a big fan of giving fans surprises. Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot has been made online about Swerve and all that, but the reality is um, surprises are a big part of wrestling. And the best way for a surprise, unless you're bringing a new guy in with a big contract, is to do a turn. And I had to fight against a few different turns, two at least, um, because I thought that the mankind babyface turn, the second one especially, was really connecting with people and that it felt real, almost above wrestling, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, and I just thought that would have been it just, I, I, not just counterproductive, but that it would have hurt the real life bond that I had really worked hard to create. In this case, yeah, I, I forgot that that turn even took place. And like I said, I do understand why, you know, why these turns take place. You have to make the TV shows exciting. And at that point, you know, they'd realized that, hey, we're not going to go with 15, 20 minute matches regularly. We're going to have six, seven minute matches, eight, eight minutes, including introductions. Like we're going to bam, 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 almost for the MTV generation when that was still a big thing. So you stop seeing like match of the year type things on Raw, but what you were seeing was like a potpourri of all kinds of different elements, almost booked for people with attention deficit issues, you know, that nobody could get bored because we were on to the next thing. Yeah. And you're constantly looking for things that are going to 
put eyeballs on the product, especially when we were still going head to head with uh, WCW. Speaking of uh, swerves, WrestleMania 15, China is going to turn on Kane to rejoin DX, but in reality, that's a swerve because Hunter turns on DX to join the corporation. So two turns in one night, when it's happening so often, you start to do it for diminished returns, right? Yeah. And, and uh, case in point, I don't even remember those turns. Yeah. 15 is just a... Uh, yeah. uh, a miss of a WrestleMania. I told you about the, did I tell you about the plane trip I had uh, with Chris Jericho? Yes. Where you guys for the entire flight just talked about how many times big show had turned. Turned. You didn't even get through them all before you landed. Right. And that yeah. was 15 years ago. Yes. So the man had turned a lot yes. and it is a case of diminishing returns. I hadn't even remembered. I didn't even know that China had turned heel with, she went back baby face. Well, Hunter simultaneously turned heel. Silly. Yeah. Uh, China is going to become the first person not only to be in the King of the, uh, in the Royal Rumble, but now in the King of the Ring tournament. It also happens in '99. She's gifted the spot by Hunter, which maybe feels a little hollow, but she would defeat Val Venus before eventually losing to Road Dog. And China and Road Dog get 13 minutes on that pay per view, by the way. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you're injured at the time, but you return in the run up for SummerSlam '99. And somehow you and China get tangled up in a shot at the number one contendership <laughs> for the title held by Steve Austin. The storyline is that Hunter was getting ready for his shot at Austin. And on the night it's announced that governor Jesse Ventura will be the special guest referee. Well, Hunter is none too happy about it. So Michaels makes a match between Hunter, Austin and Taker in the main event, but Austin takes or Hunter takes Austin out instead. And then Michaels puts China in the match. And now it's for Hunter shot at SummerSlam. I know maybe this is uh, a lot coming at you pretty fast, but the story here is China's moving up to be even mm -hmm. mentioned in the mix with those talent. Yeah. Those are the A side. This is the marquee. This is the tippy top of the profession. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't wait until uh, just a few minutes from now when we start talking about her work with Eddie Guerrero. Phenomenal. Uh, but this is probably the time when I have the match with China. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the rattlesnake returns. He hits Hunter with a chair, puts China on top. China versus Austin is now scheduled to headline SummerSlam. That might be a little silly. I mean, even today, as modern as we are, I don't know that anybody would think it's going to be Becky Lynch and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. But you return to Raw the next week when China and Hunter are squaring off for the number one contendership. You help China get the win and retain her spot. And uh, you challenge China. She refuses and gives you a low blow. Uh, and you wrote in your book, China, we both know that there's always been a vague sexual tension oh, between us. Yeah. You with your revealing outfits and me, me with, with mine. mine. Yeah. So great. You know, just um, I, I mentioned something in uh, Have a Nice Day about how uh, China, China had touched my genitalia. I said, now given... The touch occurred when her hand was balled up in a fist, was traveling at high speeds, but it's my book and I'm going to count it. Yes. Uh, a very respected uh, journalist comes to my house to do a story for me on the New York Times. And she's, and I've got the poster up in the basement, the Reed poster with me, Joni, and, and Rock. And the, she's saying, I wish I could remember her name. She was really sweet. Uh, she goes, oh, so that's, that's China, huh? I said, yeah. She goes, um, how does how does your wife feel about uh, this poster? Oh, we love her. The whole family loves her. At the same time, the woman believes that I've had some type of physical relationship. Wow! And it wasn't until she actually asked me, I went, "No, no." Like she said, "But what about the touch?" I was, oh, "That was a joke." You know, she punched me, <laughs> she punched me in the balls. <laughs> like that's not a relationship. Um, but. I do remember. I do remember that match being real, you know, tentative. Thinking she smelled, uh, she smelled incredible. Her skin was so smooth, almost like she'd been using one of our shaving products. Oh yeah, products. come on, oh, man. oh man, baby, smooth. Oh man, I love it. Love this. Um, what is the name of our Henson shaving? Henson shaving. Yeah, it was almost like she'd use Henson shaving. She smelled great. It was like wrestling a better smelling Bob Holly. Yeah, it really you for was. That. And I do, you know, here's a question I have. Maybe our fans or listeners can uh, chime in. Joni, when she was still here, uh, traded me, I think, 10 photos of that match that she had autographed in return for 10 photos that I autographed so that she could sell those photos 
and that I could do the same, um, but I still have them. I don't know what to do with them. I feel like people would like them. I'm trying to find a good uh, organization to make a donation to. So maybe our, our fans can we'll come, uh, up with something. come up with something for that. This moment where uh, she uh, punches you in the wing, uh, you, you write, as I slump to the canvas in an awkward fetal position, does that mean no? I managed to gasp <laughs> out, and even from a distance, I could see China laugh as she stepped back through the curtain. <laughs> we did have a match, and it was strange because as well as I knew her, and as helpful as I'd been to her career by letting her get physically involved, I did feel strange about having a match with her. Yeah, she and Hunter had just torn into each other only minutes earlier, but I really didn't know what to do, so I did what came naturally. I stunk up the place, and I put Mr. Sacco on her. Yeah. I love that. It was a good experience, but I did not I did not know what to do. I wasn't comfortable with the idea of forearms or anything of that nature. Right. Was that, um, was that ever discussed? I mean, it's important to remember this is a television show. Yeah. You do have to make the station happy. You don't want to offend advertisers. Um, but it's an interesting character. It's an interesting set of circumstances. It's not your yeah. traditional... Man on woman, quote unquote, violence. And the thing is, being. I did have experience wrestling women. Uh, one of the posts that I spent a long time writing, which you know is not going to get as as many looks, uh, and I also uh, I wrote it originally as a feature for Bell to Bell, so they could have the exclusive on it. But it was about my time uh, training at Mark Tendler's garage with Susan Sexton who is a really great technician and worked strong style before there was a name for it. Like, she was no nonsense. She wasn't a flyer, uh, but she was a good technician. When I wrote about her, Regal got back to me, and he said, oh, her reputation among the, the, the men and women in the U.K. Was, was, was super high. And so I did. I'd spend hours upon hours working with her and never gave her the credit she deserved, certainly not in Have a Nice Day. It wasn't until... Dozens of years went back. I was like, wow, maybe that's why I have so much respect for women's wrestling because I was working regularly with one of the most respected women of her era. Um, so I did have some experience, but it had, that had been so many years earlier. That had been 15 years earlier, I think, 12, 13 years earlier. And I did not know what to do. Man, I love talking about our friends at Jimmy's Famous Seafood.com. And if you've been watching wrestling very long, or maybe you follow any of the talent on social media, you already know all about Jimmy's famous seafood. You probably know that they have the best crab cakes in the world. And you know that everyone on both of the rosters loves them. Some Jimmy's famous seafood. Roman Reigns is in there all the time. So many of the WWE talent actually get their meals delivered. You even probably saw Miz do a skit there a couple of years ago, but maybe my favorite thing is that AEW does fundraisers there for charity all the time. These are great folks and they're big time wrestling fans and man, they got the best seafood in the world. Sincerely. Now you might be thinking, man, I'm not in Baltimore. How does this affect me? They're shipping nationwide like the Godfather, but it's legal, but it ought to be illegal. How good these damn crab cakes are. You can go ahead and check out the Maryland crab cakes in your home right now. They'll send you the soups, the chowders, the oysters, the signature steaks, all their desserts, their gluten-free items. And by the way, they've still got some great holiday gifts. If there was someone who's maybe out of town or they're hard to buy for, maybe you're getting ready to host some big shindig for new year's Eve. Maybe you're getting ready for some of the bowl games. Why not check out the famous gift box? You got four of the world's best colossal Maryland crab cakes, two different crab soups or crab dip, seafood seasoning, and their signature bay sauce. You could even check out that tailgate bundle. It's two pounds of wings, a full rack of barbecue ribs, a pint of crab dip, crab cake mix. You can even create your own package. I've known these guys for a long, long time and really, really can't recommend them enough. Every time I'm in Baltimore, I eat all of my meals there. Seriously, I'll go for lunch. I'll go back for supper. It's the best. And if you're a foodie and you watch these TV shows, you know all about them already. They've been around for more than four decades. It really is a real family business. And they've told their story many times on diners, dine-ins, and dives, beat Bobby Flay, and so many more. Hey, and if you're a big Ravens fan or you see those Ravens games, when they're doing those bumpers in and out of Baltimore, I don't think I've ever seen them not go to Jimmy's. Everybody knows Jimmy's famous seafood is the hookup, but the bad part is usually it's expensive to get this stuff shipped. You know, they got to pack it and dry ice and get it to you. And man, that's just, that's costly until now. What if it was free? 
That's right. You heard me free two day nationwide shipping on orders over 125 bucks. When you use the promo code Foley, why not have the best crab cakes in the world today? As you're listening to this, it's Christmas Eve's Eve. Well, tomorrow night I'm hosting a family dinner. I got some miniature crab balls from Jimmy's famous seafood. I got some mini stuffed shrimp from Jimmy's famous seafood. I even got my fillets that we're cooking up from Jimmy's famous seafood. You can do it too. Right now, go to Jimmy's famous seafood.com. Check out exactly what you've been looking for, and then go ahead and use the promo code Foley, and you're going to get free shipping. How do you beat that? Free shipping? Come on now. Jimmy'sFamousSeafood.com, promo code Foley. You get the uh, win and the shot. Now it's a three-way. You become champion at SummerSlam, but the next night you drop it to Hunter, and Mm -hmm. China's stock has risen. She is now slotted to start a feud with the Intercontinental Champion, Jeff Jarrett. Oh, man. Now, uh, the feud gets over like gangbusters. China is a red hot baby face here. Uh, Jarrett is a woman beating guitar swinging. I mean, he's destroying the ladies with the guitar, putting them all in the figure four. And then of course, famously he holds up Vince for money and China becomes the intercontinental champion and like a good housekeeping match, great uh, match, quite a spectacle. What do you remember the, um, the talk of the locker room being about Jarrett's circumstance. He's out of contract, but he's I was got the I was title. not aware of the circumstance. I remember specifically, I had a box of uh, books. They have a nice day books. They give you a box, and I was distributing them to people I liked, and I, I signed one for Jeff, and he. And I found out hours later. I said, Jeff, you're you're leaving. He said, I thought that's why you gave me the book. I said, Well, no, I gave you the book because I like you. Um, but I told him after I saw the last, uh, Ric Flair's last match, as I say that I'm looking right at the poster, I said, I said, Jeff, it was like I was watching you take every lesson you'd learned and absorbed through a lifetime of watching wrestling. Yes. And put it, because Jeff was phenomenal. He was, he was phenomenal. The MVP of the match. Right. And that's in large part why he's got his role with AEW, AEW now, I would think. Um, he's still there, right? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's still he's still crushing Darby's and and Stings and everybody who moves with guitars. Yeah. Uh, but he same thing can be said. He he really sunk his teeth into it. He really played up the the male chauvinist pig, and he made a great opponent, and then delivered in the match. Mm-hmm. And was willing to, you know, to look like a buffoon, and that he was, you know, baking soda all over him. And it was a really, it was a really good match. And in my travels with a show that I may or may not be a part of with WWE, I've seen the uh, outfit from that night, and it's still got some of the baking soda or flour on it. Oh wow, that's phenomenal. Um, you wrote lovingly about China in your book. She's been Intercontinental Champion. I think she's done a tremendous job. Even more important, she's Noel's idol, and she treats my daughter with a kindness that is truly touching. I may be Big Daddy O, but when Noel comes to the matches, she wants nothing to do with me. Instead, it's China holding her hand on the way to the girls' dressing room for some quality bonding. In 97, China wasn't allowed to be hit at all, even by accident. Now, after being suplexed, punched, and kicked by the top guys in the game, she definitely wrestles like one of the guys, but more important, she's accepted as one of the guys. Yes. She really was. And again, uh, as I alluded to, she had that support system. Yes. And when she left the company, that was gone. She eventually loses the title, has some matches with Chris Jericho and Hardcore Holly and the such. Um, and maybe the matches with Jericho were less than. And, and I think maybe there were some hurt feelings on either side of that, but what's happening backstage is much more important. Her and Hunter break up. And of course, Hunter eventually moves on with Stephanie McMahon. And, um, I can't imagine, you know, having to go through some sort of a breakup and be in the public eye like this, yeah. much less with a coworker like this. Uh, and then it makes it even worse when the quote unquote other woman as the boss's daughter, this is a almost a no win proposition for China, right? Yeah, it is. And I remember being on uh, the elliptical trainers together at a gym, and that's when she broke the news to me, and she was in tears, and it was really difficult. It puts her in a really, really difficult situation. 
But even with that breakup, I think you can argue that the stuff she did with Eddie. Oh yeah, it's coming up next. That's following, phenomenal. yes, was every bit as good, and depending on whose opinion it is, maybe even better than what she did with DX. She became the mamacita to his Latino heat, oh, yeah. and the first time they were on camera together, you just knew, oh, there's something there. Do we have a date for? Uh, do we have a date for when they got together? Yeah, I can find that. Tell me, tell me why, what you liked about Eddie Guerrero and, and China. Well, together. what I liked about it is I believe I was the commissioner um, when they had that amazing match where Eddie impressed upon me that he, he needed to be in that ring to look out for her. And then accidentally, uh, in covering her fallen body, picked up the victory. I, uh, I know that... Um it's it's uh, we'll call it the spring of two thousand. Okay. Uh, so M March thirtieth, I think, is when we start to see Eddie flirting so, with China. Yes. Yeah, so I'm definitely the G. I'm the, definitely the commissioner. Right. And what I remember about it, it was the first time I'd seen that Eddie Guerrero. It was like I always call it the light switching moment, where just everything changes, and in comes this ball of amazing. Charisma, and he's like, "Say hey, you have to put me in there. You can't leave my mama sit there." And I'm like, "Where did this come from?" He turned the volume. I, I'd never, sure. yeah, I hadn't. Eddie, oh, what a wonderful worker, kind and gracious human being. Came, battled his demons, you know. Came back stronger, better. I think, you know, he was written off, and then he yeah, word was getting around about a couple matches he had overseas with Regal. Regal sticking up for him. He gets a second chance in WWE. Makes the absolute, absolute most of it. Comes alive with this new Eddie Guerrero. The, you know, the, the character work. The character work. And I remember just being blown away. Like, where did this guy come from? Sort of like when Scott Steiner went from being just part of a tag team partner to the big bad booty daddy. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Wait, where was that promo all these years? I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there are those... Those moments, and just going back to that match, Eddie tell he convinces me he needs to be in that match to look out for her. And like I said, to me, it's one of the most memorable moments in WWE history. He covers Joni to protect her, and then realizes that he has pinned her. And the look on Eddie's face is you you. It's just priceless. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal, and then he's that's a mamacita, you know. And if I'm, I am, I'm hopefully not offending anyone with my weak. Uh, oh come on. Voice work. We're having fun. Okay. Um, but the two of them together, they were just tremendous. And the camera I camera loved them. The camera loved them, and I think because Joni and and Hunter were a real life couple. Uh, they didn't get to accentuate all the... Yes. So that... Look, Hunter works for a company that I, I in some ways, still work for and all, all allegedly. his love. Probably not <laughs> allegedly work for. Uh, but there was something magical about that pairing that may have been even better than the pairing of Hunter and China. I agree. It was fantastic. Uh, she becomes the Intercontinental Champion again later here in 2000. She's going to pin Trish in a tag match with Eddie and Val Venus, uh, and she's going to regain the title. But a few weeks later, as you said, she drops it to Eddie in a triple threat match with Kurt Angle, and of course he accidentally wins. And here's the breakup. Really good story. And then what do you know? She gets the opportunity that a lot of the quote-unquote divas did in that era. She posed for Playboy. You were pretty good friends with her. Was do you remember discussing that with her? Was she hesitant to uh, sort of let it all hang out, as they say, or because this is something that a lot of ladies had been offered. Sonny and Stacy Keebler both famously said no, but the Trishes of the world, and not the Trishes, but the Tories of the world, and the Sables of the world, they 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 uh, yeah. love that opportunity. I never looked a single Playboy. Uh, my my goal my. My feeling was if I was friends with somebody before, then I shouldn't be looking at them in that way. Not that it would have hurt, but the loophole was if it was on the TV show. <laughs> well, I mean, it is what it is. Right, it is what it is. And so I think I saw Joni's 
photos uh, when the right to censor came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might be off by a few months. But I do remember, and I, I was, you know, wasn't, you know, not a much of a drinker at all, but I occasionally have one or two, and I become very sentimental when I do. And I think it may, it may not have been the actual Playboy spread, but just some photos of her in the magazine done in a, you know, sensual way. And I called her up, and it was uncharacteristic of me, but I wanted her to know, like, how amazing these things were. And I went out of my way to call her, and I made like some noises. I can't remember the ooh, uchi mama, or something ridiculous like that. But that I, I want, I, I just felt like I can break that little vow or whatever I made to myself because I thought it would make her feel good. Yes. To know that I, even though I was a friend, uh, her friend, that I recognized that she was a beautiful woman. And I think that uh, the Playboy setting all those records at the time, it really, oh man, I think it had was to be a confidence it had builder. to be a confidence builder in one of the best times of her life. But I think that may have led to her contractual issues, which led to her departure from the company. And we can probably discuss that in a couple of minutes. But uh, man, at the time she had the Playboy and she was really proud of it. I think she even said she was proud of it yeah. on TV. Uh, I felt really happy for her. She'd had that major work done to her jaw and she was away for months, you know, and she came back with a new look, but it was still her. You know, I mean, this is, uh, it is um, a selective surgery, but you know, they shaved some of the bone down and gave her a more feminine look and she really embraced it. She eventually gets phased out of wrestling the men and really just gets put with the ladies. Uh, she's in the women's division. Why do you think that is? Was there just pushback from the guys? Is that coming down from the office? I don't know. That would be something. Probably be like a something for grilling Jr. or something to talk about with Bruce Beast. I did not know, but it was clear that once, if they felt like that was all she could do then maybe the thing to do would have been to like send her on a goodwill tour, let her cash in on a lot of the, you know, the opportunities were coming uh, at a rapid pace and bring her back when they did have something really good. I don't know, that's just, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. But it was clear that that was a... It's a demotion. It, it was a demotion because the women's division then... Well, it's not what it is now. It's not what it is now. And it was essentially in the, the death spot, it's the popcorn match. And it's not hanging out with The Undertaker or Stone Cold or The Rock or whatever she had been yeah, doing yeah. up to this point. Uh, after the Royal Rumble 2001, she does a handspring back elbow. And the story is she hurt her neck. Jerry Lawler rushes over from commentary like when Owen fell. And the whole thing was treated as a very serious injury. But, of course, it's bought by no one. Uh, eventually, she returns. She squashes Ivory at WrestleMania 17. She becomes the women's champion. But she's only with the company for seven more weeks, uh, even defeating Lita at Judgment Day. But then she never returns to WWF TV again. And I realize that by this point, you're starting to wind it down. We know you're never officially done with WWE. Um, this is what, what, what month and year is this? So 2001 is when WrestleMania 17 right. happens. And just seven weeks later, she's gone. So we'll call it June mm -hmm. of, of 2001. This is when the company is... Up till WrestleMania 17, hotter than ever. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's famously where Stone Cold turns heel, and you start to see the business fall a little bit in April, falls a little bit more in May, falls a little bit more in June. Fans weren't ready, and they didn't want to see a heel Stone Cold. They wanted to cheer Stone Cold. But at the same time, she probably feels like, wait a minute, I, I was working with Eddie Guerrero and Chris Jericho, and now no offense, but I'm working with Ivory. It's not quite the same. And she had run into a brick wall contractually, right? She, uh, according to JR, felt like she needed to be at that million dollar level. And uh, JR would say, once upon a time, the, the biggest downside guarantee that you could get in WWE was a million dollars. Whether you were Stone Cold or The Rock or The Undertaker or Triple H, that was the number. She saw herself in that light, and the WWE did not. So they got to an impasse based on that. Uh, you were friendly with Joni. Is that the version of the story you heard? I don't know if I heard this story directly from her. I was uh, going through my own issues at the time 
uh, that we talked about during the commissioner uh, episode. Um, man, you know, Joni would have made over a million dollars. You know, I, when I ended up signing, Steve and I signed at just about the same time in 97. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but she would have made over a million dollars had she continued to be programmed with Eddie and Jericho. Yeah. And no offense, but if she's working with Ivory in, and now just in the women's division, yeah. would she? Well, you know, the, the booking formula was, there's no textbook. A lot of it was a gut feeling. Yes. And I remember, you know, I would call up Jim. Jim's still a dear friend. How he went through so many years as a director of talent relations. I'll never know. Held everybody's respect. That's a real testament to Jim. But a lot of it was, it's what they felt was earned. And I remember, you know, Jim, uh, the payoff's a little light. He goes, oh, yeah, Max, sorry, but uh, you weren't in that main event. I said, Jim, these shows are selling out before we even put a card up. It's the company and the people that are seen as the major players who are selling those tickets. Of which you are one. And I am one of those guys. Yes. So whether you choose to put me lower on the card in front of a, a crowd that's been sold out for months, that's up to you. But I'm telling you, I think I deserve more. But I think that's a really valid point. I think Joni was worth the million dollars. I do too. I do too. And then here, like when I do my, when I do my, one man shows, right? And we talked in private about how I'm not chasing the biggest guarantee I can get because then you get 20 shows all around the globe and mm -hmm. you're traveling 10 hours each show. But I do need to get a decent guarantee because a decent guarantee shows me that that venue has an interest in the show doing well. If you just say, I'll take whatever I bring in, that's nice and it's noble and there's part of me that likes that, but it puts zero pressure on that club to let people know you're coming in there because they have nothing to lose. WWE, if they'd offer the million dollar contract, would have to put her in a good mm -hmm. spot. Yes. Because that's how they would make their money back. But I have no doubt that if they had used her well, that she was worth that million dollars. And she was, to me, a gold mine for bringing the company into the mainstream which was really important. And there really were not that many mainstream stars. Less than 10, I would say. Mm -hmm. And Joni was one of them. Yes. And I think, you know, bigger picture, if calmer heads could have prevailed, um, I don't know. It's just, it's tragic that they could not reach a, that they could not reach an agreement. And I think that uh, the, the the Cliff's notes is that once uh, Hunter and uh, Stephanie were together, that Joni's career was over. But we've just gone through the months. That was not years. the case. That's not the case. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This holiday season, do something for a special person in your life. You give yourself a gift to raise your spirits, and not just for the day. I mean, let's face it: the the holidays can be a really tough time between managing the family dynamics, racing from thing to thing, braving the cold and dark weather, it's normal to feel down. Having someone to talk to about how you're feeling and what you can do about it is truly a gift. And let me explain guys, so just to pull the curtain back a little bit. I myself entered therapy in 2006. I had ended a long-term relationship and, and I just didn't know how to move forward. It felt awesome to be able to talk to someone who didn't really know me and wasn't a part of my everyday life and just sort of lean on them and get their advice. I learned some real coping skills and it made me feel a lot better. Well, it's even easier these days. Thanks to better help as the world's largest therapy service. Better help has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists. And by the way, it's a hundred percent online. Plus it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can switch easily to a new therapist anytime. It really couldn't be any simpler. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Why not learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Foley. That's better H E L P.com slash Foley. One more time, betterhelp.com slash Foley. And, uh, but yeah. a lot of people would believe that she believed and these are fans so they don't really know Joni Lauer you did 
do you think she believed that she didn't get that offer? Maybe not because Hunter didn't want her to have it or Stephanie didn't want her to have it, but maybe Vince was trying to protect his daughter? Because Vince is in a tough spot, and I don't think enough people really talk about that. And you've been very plain, even on this program in in more recent weeks, saying, hey, Vince doesn't care if you disagree with him politically. Uh, He may not like you. You guys might not be friends and want to go have a beer, but he's going to do what's best for business. Yeah. But in this particular case, it might feel like one of the first and only times that it's not just maybe his feelings that he has to consider, because lots of talent would leave and say, oh, Vince is this and Vince is that. And then they come back. But now he's got to think about his daughter. And, and as a father, man, that's a tough spot. Because what I know about you more than anything else just from doing this show is you're going to do what you can to protect and take care of your kids. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that might not be popular for everybody else, but that's not as important as you taking care of your kids. Mm -hmm. And so I could totally buy into, even if we could push her and maybe get a return at what cost personally for my family. I I think it was dollars and cents. Okay. And keep in mind, there's no more WCW. Right. Or ECW. There's talk about that would have been a giant jump and a huge acquisition for WCW. She had no leverage. As we right. Were she had no leverage. She ended up going to Japan. I, I heard Jim on the, uh, uh, I mean, this is one of the shows that's out there. It's the DX. Um, uh, it's the, the A&E uh, show. The A&E show. He said a million dollars. She wanted what Stone Cold was getting, and that's not going to happen. So as big as Joni was, there's only one Stone Cold. Well, in fairness, that was his downside. Stone Cold made a whole hell of a lot yeah. more than a million dollars. And see, yes, it was. So I'm saying I'm with you. I think they should. She should have gotten it. Yeah. The company was public. They're making a, a, a lot of money. Not as much as they would once they uh, uh, started attracting more sponsors with right. uh, more family friendly product uh, and expanding overseas and doing all the different things it took to stay alive. Uh, you know, uh, going head to head with the UFC and surviving through the pandemic and even flourishing. They've done made a lot of right moves. But now we're talking about a company that's worth well over a billion dollars. Uh, I think Joni would have been a good investment, uh, but she did not really have a backup plan. And I think as much as leaving WWE hurt her financially, Leaving that atmosphere might not have been the worst thing. With the well, with the support, I'm talking about the support system. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know <coughs> that that was probably long term even more devastating. Because you have to appreciate too. Not only did she, and boy, I'm not trying to pile on here, but she loses her relationship, and now she's going to lose her job. And in a weird way, and and you know how this is, I'm sure, better than most. This is like your second traveling family. Yeah. And so if you lose your relationship, you kind of lose your quote unquote real family. And now you've lost your work family and your career. It's a, it's, it's a tough spot for her to be in. And, and, And to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, as far as what her value was to the company, just to remind everybody, Sable left and sued WWE in June of 99. So as we fast forward a little bit, China is by far the number one most marketable, most merchandised piece of female talent that the company has under contract. Sable doesn't come back for a few years, but at this point, there is no Sunny, there is no Sable. She's kind of, you know, not to, not to anybody. What about Trish and Lita are... Oh, they're on the rise. Yeah, yeah. No yeah, doubt about yeah. it. But she's the more established from the really hot years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she is. Uh, there are other folks in the mix, but man, when Sa- when Sunny came on the scene, she's the most downloaded. She's the most over. When Sable exploded, boy, merch was just flying off yeah. the shelves. She's established I- I- as a as a quote unquote top guy. Pardon the pun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I just can't help but wonder like. There has to be more to it than just she wanted too much money. Because even if even if we went with uh, the downside guarantee idea, if she's working with guys, to your point, she's going to exceed that. But if she's working with the ladies, maybe not. 
I could see how she could feel. And again, I never even met her. This is where it's more, this is just, I can only speculate. Right, right, right. This is where you have, you know, on her same network, Bruce and JR, who were in there and knew the nitty gritty of the that process. So I'm not trying to excuse WWE. I do think where things get really ugly is in the aftermath and the idea that she was never brought back yes. and never honored until she was no longer with us. And that's super sad. But Joni could also be her worst enemy yeah. because she would... Um, Make some different decisions. Uh, yeah, and also not just... But as far as the bad mouthing the company, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, and being on radio shows and and being in a t- tough, rough way uh, with with alcohol and substances and not taking responsibility. Even when she was on Celebrity Rehab, she was really fighting the idea that she even had a problem to begin with. And it was difficult for me when I would watch her on. Um, Surreal, ha- surreal life. Yes. And here's Noel, who idolized Joni, and we're watching this uh, very pre-staged uh, staged thing where Joni's using the thigh master and simulating an orgasm, and it's uncomfortable for me to watch. And I said to Noel, "This isn't the China that we know." And it was like she was kind of playing a role, but she wasn't. I mean, I remember I was offered the role for a Surreal Life, and they said, though, they're, you know, I, I, I said, well, isn't this kind of like, like we'll have Washed Up Loser written all over it? And Barry Bloom goes, well, it did, but now it's a way where people are actually making comebacks and springboarding their careers, and this has happened over and over and over with different people. Um, and I, they, when I found out that Joni was the competition, like, oh, well, they're going to they're gonna choose Joni. And Barry said, why? He goes, I said, because she's going to fall apart on camera, and I'm not. And nobody wants to be the boring guy on The Surreal Life, right. right? Yeah. And so you have to vie for attention by amplifying your own attributes. And at that point, her attribute was that her life was falling apart. We were going to watch it on camera. She had a relationship with Sean Waltman that wasn't going well. And then they edited it in a way that Sean looks like the ultimate crummy boyfriend. And it was just, I mean, it was a train wreck that we get to watch, and it wasn't pleasant, but it's tough to take your eyes off it at the same time. It's just a shame, and uh, I can't help but wonder what if, and, you know, not trying to point fingers in any direction, but it does feel like, as you said earlier, the pay structure, going back to that, it was kind of... There's not a rule book. There's not a formula. Like right. if you're if you work for the government, there's different levels. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a GS whatever, yeah. and I'm at this level or that level. It's not really that way with wrestling. It's kind of arbitrary at times. It is. And uh, if and if, I did not think the women got what they deserved. Amen. We then. agree. We agree totally. So. She wrote a great book I want to mention. If they only knew, you mentioned you got a chance to to uh, read it. She works briefly for New Japan in 02. Uh, maybe her most notable match is uh, losing to Masahiro Chono in October of 02. She's going to do various appearances, you know, television. You mentioned The Surreal Life. Uh, she does eventually even try her hand at uh, adult films. She legally changes her name to China in 07, so they can't tell her she can't use it. Uh, and then in 2011, you guys wound up appearing together for some TNA shows. Yeah. When you run into her after all that time at the TNA show, what's what's she like then, 2011? Well, a lot of the joy was seemed to have been gone. And there were a few times uh, where I'd get a phone call from her late at night. And she was in a tough, she was in a really tough place. And... Uh, I remember saying she didn't want to go back to adult films. Uh, She made it out to be a really mean business. Um, Wait, so she didn't just regret the decision and maybe the way people perceive it? Because we've talked about that before here on the program, that uh, adult film stars at times are treated less than. uh, And I, I totally, I mean, I don't know anybody who does that, but I understand that. But. I wonder when you say it's a mean business, she re- she received, in your opinion, poor treatment from those within the industry? She didn't go into details. Okay. Um, because I, I guess the speculation was that she was looking to get back into it. 
Can you believe it? It's finally here. It's the most wonderful time of the year, unless you get stressed out about how to pay for it. Savewithconrad.com can help you make this the best Christmas ever. You won't make a house payment for the next two months. That's right. Skip your next two house payments and use all that cash for your extra holiday expenses. And come next year, you're going to have a lower monthly payment. Don't put Christmas on a credit card. Pay your credit card debt off at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Savewithconrad.com. So uh, her last match ever uh, happens for TNA. It's Karen and Jeff Jarrett uh, taking on uh, China and Kurt Angle. Uh, she would go back and forth uh, to Japan. She even becomes an English teacher there for a few years. I think the last time you saw her was Money at the Bank or uh, Money in the Bank. I think she watched the uh, the show with you. There's even a link for your YouTube, so we'll we'll throw some footage up there. Um, was that the last time you talked to her? Wasn't the last time I talked to her. It was the last time I saw her. So she was at the um, Eternal Con on Long Island, and I was told after the fact that um, she did not know how we I would would receive her. She was nervous about it. Um, she had been kind of incommunicado for a long time when she went to Japan, and I thought she was getting her life together. I did not know that there had been what seemed to be a suicide attempt mm. by rushing the police. Uh, police in Japan don't carry firearms. It might be part of the reason why uh, you know she was subdued uh, and she was told to go home. This is what I heard. Um, and so there is a moment, and I'm glad they captured it on the Vice, uh, on the on the Dark Side of the Ring documentary they did about her. I don't know if it was officially Dark Side of the Ring, but it was on Vice. And uh, oh, I'm looking at uh, Joni at our house, and you guys are free to use that footage. Um, so I see her and we embraced and I remember seeing that footage. Wow. I was having a tough time getting around with my hip at that time. Yeah. And I asked her if she wanted to come back to the house and watch the show with me. And I remember calling my wife on the way home. I said, uh, she goes, how did it go? I said, well, good. I said, Hey, I'm bringing home a, a friend to watch the pay-per-view. And, uh, she goes, who is it? I said, China. She goes, no, really? I said, Oh, it's China. And that and there was no discussion. It was like, yeah, that's China is our friend. We love her and our family. And uh she came over and you see the greeting, you know, with Noel and Joni. And I'm so glad, so glad we had that time that we spent together. Uh I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, but um when I was with Joni, I could see hundreds several hundred uh, gig marks on her arm. So she had been self-harming and it looked like she'd been doing that for a long time. And uh, you know, when I was a volunteer for Rain, I learned a lot about people who self-harm and how oftentimes uh, not only is there a release of endorphins, but it is the ability to control and not have a mastery over, but to be in control of a physical pain while, which somehow soothes the uncontrollable emotional pain that someone does not have a handle over. And those were always the most difficult discussions I would have with visitors to the RAIN um, Help helpline because the conversations will always go around in circles and it was always come back to the self-harming as the only solution. Um, and so I saw someone who was in uh, just an indescribable amount of pain or had been trying to go back and make a comeback. And I did, pl I pleaded with her when I saw the schedule. I thought you're coming back, now is the time to dip your toe in the shallow end. And the people in charge of her at that time had her taking a deep dive and uh, involving Opie and Anthony. And I really enjoyed being on that show, but uh, that wasn't the best place for her to be. I thought the idea of her showing up at WWE headquarters was foolish. I just, I just thought that this is not... This... They were asking her to take on too much. In, Emotionally. in not looking out for her best interest. She did have a really good friend there uh, who was at our house, and he, I believe, runs her, her Twitter account. Um, personally, I don't want a Twitter account when I'm gone. 
and I've even had that in my, uh, you know, my will. <laughs> no, no, tell my kids individually, no, no, if you want to honor dad on your own accounts, that's fine, but I don't want any account with a blue check mark, you know, where you're saying, showing old footage. I'm, you know, that's personal decision, but it's just strange to me. And I think Joni's in the Hall of Fame. I think all these hashtags, you know, to get her in again on her own, it's like, she's in there. Yeah. Like, this is a compromised situation. And now she's getting she's getting a, a wonderful A&E documentary, from yes. what I understand. She's being acknowledged. She's being talked about. Her contributions have never been more recognized. It's so unfortunate. I mean, it's so tragic, and it's and from my own standpoint, I would probably get an email once a week from Joni mm. to, between the time she was at my house and the time she died. And almost 201, I was like, hey, listen, sorry, I don't have much time to respond, blah, 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 blah. It was always rushed. And the one time I was supposed to see her, she was supposed to be in an autograph signing, and she was supposed to be at the table with Noel, and Joni didn't make it because of I issues. And so she was struggling until the end. She was really struggling until the end. I think the people, like I said, the same people who saw who put her on this schedule saw fit to do a memorial that was like a circus where you could get a better seat if you paid more money. It's like, no, 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 this is not the way you honor somebody. This is not the way you show your respect or admiration or love for somebody. This is everything you don't want happening. Uh, when we lose somebody. So I'm glad that the pendulum is swinging and hopefully it stays here where we say, this is a woman who made a major difference. Uh, th those two things, the strength contrasted with that vulnerability was what made her who she was, but it was also what uh, caused her to leave well before her time. Just 45 years old. It's unbelievable. Yeah. We will... Uh... We'll throw up some information at the uh, at the end of the program here. Uh, if you're watching this and you uh, maybe have indulged in self harm and you're struggling yeah. with that, we'll, we'll pass along some information that might be useful for you. And I uh, I can't imagine how hard this was for her at the very end. And what I really hope most of all is that her legacy is not defined by the way she left us, right. but how great she was when she was. Man, you want to talk about exceeding expectations. Did anybody do that more than her, probably? No. I mean, realistically, like, to go from being a Mr. Hughes replacement, right. a female Mr. Hughes replacement who's never supposed to wrestle, to now being one of the biggest acts in the entire industry, certainly at the top of the WWE. And by that point, WCW was so far in the rearview mirror, and it was because of acts like China. And not just with women's wrestling, but becoming the Intercontinental Champion, being in the yeah. King of the Ring, being in the Royal Rumble, and taking whatever stones people threw at her. Oh, she looks like a man, or whatever the criticisms were. And she becomes one of the highest selling issues of Playboy ever. Like, you talk about an, a true underdog story and mm -hmm. a success story. And it's just a shame that maybe everyone knew that but her at the end. And uh, if, if um, anyone out there is listening and they have indulged in taking pot shots on social media, even if not at Joni, at anyone, think through those decisions. Uh, yeah. Really think about what you're trying to accomplish. And if, you're, if, if your goal is to hurt another human being, you're a douchebag. If if you think it's harmless, it's not. And I just think if people knew the the harm that they were inflicting, I'm not I'm not saying that uh, cruelty uh, played a hand in Joni's death, but it certainly didn't, didn't help. help. Didn't help. So. And to be clear, listen, I, we have fun on this show every now and again. It's different if it's uh, two friends busting balls. You and Miz. Right. You and Al Snow. But to be mean-spirited for the sake of being mean-spirited and yeah. to be personal, not in a cheap pop right here in Huntsville right. kind of way, uh, let's we'll all strive to be better. Yeah, yeah, I think we can. Right? Let's, stay, let's kick off the new year by trying to be kinder and gentler and better to each other. <laughs>
Woo Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time World Heavy weight champion. Tell him, Nate. Wings! Legendary flavors! World Championship Wings! Woo! Woo Wings! Yeah! Woo Woo! Let's do a few questions and then we'll wrap this one up. Um, first of all, what do you think What do you think China's legacy will be? What do you think Joni's legacy in wrestling oh, will be? You know will what? it be the Intercontinental win? I don't, yeah, um, well, I, I don't know if you could pick one moment. I yeah. mean, her legacy is that she was a trailblazer. Absolutely. Well ahead of her time, yeah. finally getting long overdue recognition. Uh, so well deserved. But if I had to pick one thing, I think Intercontinental Champion. Yeah. That's, that's, what a moment. Yeah, what a great moment. Uh, let's do a few here. Two Count Kyle wants to know without China, do you think women's wrestling would be where it is today? No, I, I, no, because I think Joni inspired a lot of the women who would go on to be the next generation of wrestlers, and it'd be those women who would be looked up to who inspired the current stars of today. But probably, I, I'd you know, I'd probably the stars of today looked up to Joni as well. Her success in wrestling men. I think made people look at women's wrestling a little differently. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's not to discount, you know, the contributions of someone like a Bull Nakano or a Medusa. Right. But the world wasn't maybe as ready to embrace it yet. Yeah. But somehow she brought credibility to, well, if she can beat up this guy or that guy, yeah. this is a different thing. I mean, Joni, it would be a cinch to have her as the... Uh, GM for women's wrestling. Oh my or gosh! Playing yeah. some t- if it wasn't in WWE, then it would be somewhere, and she'd be making appearances. Look, I went through all that stuff in 2009, 2010, where the big word was relevant, 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 trying to be relevant, 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 and then you realize one one year now, all of a sudden, a few months later, people are dressing up for you as Halloween. Yeah, you're not irrelevant. You're part of people's childhoods. Yeah. You're part of their memories, and that pendulum would have swung, and Joni would be commanding. You know, she'd be making. She'd be crushing right now. She'd be crushing it. She'd be really doing well on the appearances. People get to see that. I, you know, the saddest thing to me about her death is I never get to hear that laugh again. Mm. Not ever been another laugh like it. It was just so endearing. It was so nerdy, but that's who she was. You know, and it was like, I'm thinking in my head, I can't do justice to it. Uh, I wish I had uh, those type of skills. But it was this, like, way that her voice would get deep, and it was, I mean, and, it'd be, uh, and you couldn't help but pop. And she'd laugh at her own stuff before you even had a chance to laugh at it. But it was the, it's the laugh I miss the most. Brad Stanton says, uh, we've heard from JR that China only wanted to wrestle with uh, men. Uh, do you know if there were women she enjoyed working with? I do not know. Uh, Matt Godfrey has a natural question, and I know a lot of people are going to poke fun at this, but she did become the Intercontinental Champion, and for a lot of guys, that becomes a stepping stone to the world title. Do you think there's an alternate (laughs) universe where maybe she could have been the world champ? I do. I do, too. I do. I mean, look, Vince McMahon was world champion. David Arquette was world champion. Vince Russo was world champion. Yeah, I think there's a very real chance that she could have been world champion. If Miz can be world champion... Dog on so. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a lot of fun. We're going to start 2023 off with a bang. Next week on Folia's Pod, we're talking about Abdullah the Butcher. Oh, I love it. This oh. is going to be a lot. Oh, fun. wow. That'll be great. Uh, in the meantime, if you think we've earned it, man, hit the like button. Throw us a subscribe. Leave us a five-star review if you think we've earned it. We'd love to have uh, your interactions on Twitter uh, for the show. It's at Folia's Pod. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad. Now, if you want to hang out with the Micker, he's on Instagram over at Real Mick Foley. And, uh, of course, we would love to have you introduce any of the wrestling fans in your life to our YouTube. That's foleyonyoutube.com. 
uh, hit the like button, the subscribe button, turn on your notifications bell. That's the best way to introduce somebody to the show. Maybe they're a little overwhelmed at times with our run times. We tend to get a little long in the tooth, but little appetizers, little sample size over there at Foley on YouTube.com. Man, I uh, I had a lot of fun. 2022 was a blast doing this show with you, and I'm ready for a big 2023. So am I. Yeah, it's going to take me a while. I'm going to have this ride. Ride going to be kind of a sober one. That was a, uh, I was a tough journey, but I'm glad I'm glad uh, you took me on it with you. I want to encourage everybody to go out of your way to relive some of those great China moments. I'm going to recommend that you check out her match with Jeff Jarrett. See when she wins that Intercontinental title. Why not watch that 1999 Royal Rumble where she's the first woman in that one as well? And there's a little bit of a glimpse of the real-life Joni, the character behind the character, if you check out Beyond the Mat, which we've covered in the past. You can hear that famous laugh. You can see her just being herself, real-life Joni. Um, That's how we should probably celebrate her memory and and, and remember her most. And also, I've had the real... I'll go out, you know, if they want to yell at me for saying this, they can... Um, I have gone out on the road pursuing some of Joni's lost memorabilia, and it's been a great journey and an honor to try to track it down and bring it to a place where it can be enjoyed by tens of thousands of people, which we believe at this point will be uh, at, Roy- at the Royal Rumble. And so uh, it's been really good to be there hands-on trying to track down some of those incredible memories that she created for us. And memories they are. Go watch it. Go check it out. That famous stuff, that awesome stuff that she did with Eddie Guerrero and just on and on and on. What could have been gone too soon. Uh, Joni Lauer, just 45 years old. Let's celebrate the good times. Let's go turn on some good stuff and remember the good old days for China today. That's what she would have liked. And we'll be back next week uh, with a totally different topic. (laughs) The bad man from the Sudan, Abdul the Butcher, right here on Foley is Pod. Have a nice new year.